Welcome back to the third hour of our program. Tom Hartman here with you. And uh, on the line with us is the science reporter for BuzzFeed News, buzzfeed.com, of course, Peter Aldous. Uh, his own website, Peter Aldous, A L D H O U S dot uh, com, and his uh, Twitter handle, P A L D H O U S, or at BuzzFeed as well. Uh, Peter, uh, welcome to the program. Uh, you have done a deep dive into uh, what happened in Texas after this uh, uh, god awful storm that seems to, you know, be uh, climate change on steroids. You know, spilling Arctic air all the way down to Texas took out the power grid down there. You want to tell us about it? Yeah, uh, glad to be with you. Yeah, we. What I did is with my colleagues is do what's called an excess deaths analysis. So we were looking at the official count coming out from the state of Texas, uh, which uh, last time I looked stood at 151, and thinking that that number was likely not accurate. Um, we can go into why it was likely an undercount if, if, if you'd like, but what we decided to do was look at CDC data on, on deaths, which they maintain. Uh, look at how many you would expect in any given week, which is a, a thing you can do statistically, and then look at the difference in individual weeks, both in Texas and we looked at the surrounding states as well, which experienced much of the same weather, but, but didn't experience those prolonged power outages. And what uh, transpired from this after we'd also accounted from, uh, for COVID deaths as well and taken those out of the picture was a very pronounced spike in deaths above what's expected in Texas in the week following the storm and during the power outages. So that's the week ending February the 20th. Our best estimate is that 702 people died uh, mm -hmm. that wouldn't have died likely if the storm and power outages hadn't have happened. Um, there's some uncertainty around that because this is a statistical method, but even the lower end of our range, which was 426, is almost three times the state's official count. And, and that, that we think is pretty important. Like if we're going to prevent stuff like this happening before and harden Texas's infrastructure, particularly in energy, so that this doesn't happen, um, you, you need to know the full toll, which is what we were trying to do with our reporting here. Yeah, I totally get that. You, uh, you opened the article with the story of uh, a, a woman whose husband died during the, during the uh, power outage there, down there in Texas, uh, you know, and he had a few medical conditions. Uh, but she's convinced he died of hypothermia or he died of the medical conditions being triggered by his not being able to stay warm. Uh, I think it was a heart attack, as I recall. Um, and, uh, and, and yet his death was not recorded as having anything to do with the storm. It had, you know, just, oh, yeah, this guy had coronary artery disease. So, you know, it was that. Was there any politics involved in that? I mean, there, there is some considerable evidence that that uh, in Florida, for example, Ron DeSantis was rigging COVID numbers back in the last, you know, April, May, June, July uh, of last year, and, and, and perhaps through the whole day, maybe he still is, I don't know. I mean, you know, he had one of his uh, state statisticians call him out on it. He fired her, uh, then he, you know, sent the police in to raid her, her house and take her computer. And I don't think we've seen any resolution to that. Is this an example of the same kind of thing happening in Texas, where a Republican administration is basically trying to provide cover? In this case, not for you know a president who let a, a, a virus go nuts, but uh, for a, a state power system, uh, you know that is privately owned and and that you know frankly also owns many of the politicians in the state. Well. Um that, those are complicated questions. I, yes. I, I won't get into it here, but the Florida situation is uh, is probably more complicated than that as well. Mm -hmm. But um, in Texas, I I don't think that's exactly what's going on. I think we've got what we've got here is the Department of State Health Services is trying to do this count, but they're doing it by the traditional means of doing that, which is gathering data from individual counties. 
uh, for what their medical examiner, or in the case of most of the counties of Texas who don't have a medical examiner, they have a justice of the peace sign off on cause of death. Now, that's a system that is going to lead, uh, particularly with death, uh, that may be triggered by cold, which could be hypothermia, but could just be an exacerbation of existing disease. But that doesn't mean they weren't killed indirectly by the storm and power outages. It's going to lead to a lot of those deaths being attributed to their underlying medical conditions. Right. And absolutely, our analysis suggests that the, the, uh, the most of these people were already medically vulnerable and that their prior conditions likely contributed to the deaths. But I think, you know, in many of these cases, they would likely still be alive today if their power hadn't have gone out in, in the freezing cold. So my view, having been sort of pretty deep inside this story, my colleagues were speaking to families, I was doing the statistical analysis and the public records requests and what have you. My view is it's not so much deliberate obfuscation of the of the number, but it's, uh, it's an approach to gathering the numbers that is almost bound to have a large uncounted number of deaths that were actually linked to the storm. And it's very similar to what we saw after Hurricane Maria. So after Hurricane Maria hit Puerto Rico, um, the official death count uh, for months afterwards was 64. Yet um, analyses very similar to the one I've run, and I've in fact used my methods on the Puerto Rico deaths, and I find this pretty much the same as the New York Times found at the same time. Uh, when you do this excess death approach, you get a much larger number. And, and that was a little bit of a different disaster. That was, you know, they lost power over a very long time. Right. But, but again, it was similarly people who were already medically vulnerable were their conditions exacerbated by the fact that they didn't have electric power and clinics didn't have electric power and so on. And, and that increases death rates. Unfortunately, that's right. just what happens. Well, Texas, it's very acute in one week and, and cold is, yeah, cold is a killer. Yeah, no, I, I totally get it. We're talking with Peter Aldis, the science reporter for BuzzFeed.com, BuzzFeed News. And, uh, and, and we have about a minute and a half, Peter, before we're going to hit a hard break. Um, I'm curious, given the importance of death statistics in, uh, at the very least, helping establish a public consensus uh, or support for political policies or, or you know, uh, uh, I, I'm lacking the phrase, but, you know, like, do we do, do, should we redo our power grid, you know, for example, or should we reevaluate? Um, what, what's the lesson out of this? Is it that there is a different way that we should be evaluating these statistics, publishing these statistics, or I mean, where, where, what's your recommendation? Well, where I do think, we go with this? Yeah, I, th I think there are two things. One is I would argue that the methods we used are more appropriate to get the, the full toll in circumstances like that. That's one right. conclusion. Specifically for Texas, Texas was warned that its grid was vulnerable to, uh, to, to outages under conditions like this, specifically when a similar but not quite so prolonged storm happened in 2011. Right. And, okay, the legislature there has just passed some measure that will uh, improve the situation a bit, but I think if you speak to energy experts, they will tell you that more could be done. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. Peter Aldis, science reporter at BuzzFeed News, buzzfeed.com, peteraldis.com, and P. Aldis at, uh, on, on Twitter and, and, of course, at BuzzFeed. Peter, thank you. Great talking with you.